So I'm joined now by Chantal Kraviazak and Rain Mehta. Welcome to the show. How are you? Good. <laughs> we're in uh, two different cities, so. So we're really good. No, just kidding. <laughs> Well, I think every married couple has said that more than once. So let's just jump right in. I think it's super important that in a relationship you have that balance, right? Like you're, you've got your autonomy where you get some equity and then you also have stuff that you grow together with equity. Um, and I, I do feel that Rain and I have been really lucky that I'm this like independent force and so is he. And, and then we overlap in this beautiful way too. Yeah, well, that, that's interesting because you've both enjoyed very successful careers independently, but in recent years, you've started to officially release music together under the name of Moon versus Sun. So, I mean, you've been together as a couple for, I think, over 20 years. So what took you so long to actually make and, and put out this music together? Right. I mean, my story... What my took you story, so long? <laughs> yeah, my story is that I think it took a minute. We just didn't want to make an album or write songs together for the sake of doing it. It felt like we needed to say something. And I, I think personally, it just took a while to get really comfortable um, to go that deep, you know, to, it, to be honest, like the coaching we did with, with our guy, Dr. John up North in Sonoma, and even some of the other little retreats we did with, on, with the Mago and stuff, all, all kind of like marriage partnership coaching. It got me to the point where it felt like we could finally, um, say stuff that really was going to, I don't know, not shock people, but be really, really honest. And it just doesn't happen. Like, I don't know, you, you, you got to put in the time, right? I don't know if it's 10,000 hours applies mm -hmm. to marriage, but for me, it mm -hmm. really felt like just being secure with where we were as a couple to be able to go out on stage or in the studio and talk about stuff that was as vulnerable as, as our first album was. And I was going to say that I think maybe there's a vulnerability to putting yourself out there. I'm I not saying, I, you know, like I'm not saying consciously. I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. I mean, first of all, when Rain and I met, we were both kind of already, you know, really starting our thing separately. So that's how we met. I was not a Yoko Oh no, <laughs> I wasn't breaking up the band, you know? So I had my own thing. I was, I've always been really into my own thing and loved it. And, you know, Rain produced a couple of my records and I loved that, but but I still was, you know, very much on my own journey. But uh, I think when you do stuff publicly with your partner, yeah. you're really putting yourself out there. And once Rain and I did go through all that coaching, what coaching does is it just sets up your safety net. You know, like I, I can remember before if we had a fight, I was like, are we going to divorce? Am I ever going to see him again? Is he going to speak to me again? <laughs> and I'm always worried, you know. And, um, you know, now I, I'm not scared to go through things with rain because we have all of that, that sort of, there's a bunch of stuff that it's just solidified. So we can go out there, we can fall flat on our face. We can fail as a couple and it doesn't matter because we, we have that, that these guardrails in place now. And, and there, there and is so, one other yeah. caveat. There's one other caveat where it's like, it was just, we just couldn't find the time, to be honest. Like we, we yeah, even once we felt like, okay, like it's time to do this. We wrote a song called I Love It When You Make Me Beg, probably in like 2015 and felt like, wow, that this is incredible. This is like the direction, the tone, instrumentation, arrangement, all that stuff kind of came together really quickly, like late one night in the studio. And then we just felt like, okay, we'll just do this. Like, I don't know, a couple of times a week. And in a few months we'll have an album three years later we had nothing so yeah. like kids dogs yeah. careers, Our own careers. Yeah. travel all that stuff it just never it never materialized so finally a friend of ours said yeah we wanted to we wanted to to film it and document it because we thought it would be special but she was like you need to get out of here and so we finally went to this tiny little island isolated secluded ourselves for a few weeks and wrote the wrote the album it's the uh, the common story with artists. They retreat to a cabin in the woods to record their album. And I think there's a reason why. So before we get into this, you know, this very public uh, putting in the work that you did, I, I do have one question I wanted to get in first, but cause I never, I never ask about band names, but I'm going to make an exception here because yours involves an artist that I play an awful lot on my show. 
and is one of my favorite people to interview. So can you explain how a rapper named Sage Francis comes into play uh, here? Yeah, I mean, say I, I, I'm a huge like spoken word guy and 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 be poetry and all that stuff. And um, uh, there's, a, there's a whole thing going on in Providence, Rhode Island, like of all places in America. But Sage is like one of the, you know, one of the he's kind of the the top of the food chain in that sense. He's made some incredible albums. We met uh, a guy named Jared Paul, who's kind of part of Sage's camp and B Dolan and all those guys. And Jared was on my first solo album. He was, he was a feature on that. He actually toured with us, opened for us all across Canada. And nice. I, don't, I don't think he'd ever been anywhere close to like Winnipeg or Calgary, but he came on a bus with us and, and did that, which was super dope. And then, yeah, you know, that song title um, came from a Sage song. We actually don't, you know, it's more that Moomber Sun is more tied to like the, the album and the documentary. And now this next kind of chapter is more uh, just Rain and Chantel just using our names. But yeah, I, I mean, heavily influenced by, by Sage. And that guy has more wisdom and words in one song than most people's whole careers. Nice. Yeah, he's great. So you, you've talked a lot about putting the work, um, you know, having oh. these tools. So for people who don't know, can you tell us a is little Rowan? bit about... Sorry, is that Rowan needs to shut up? Chantel He's going to the bathroom. Rowan. He's on with a teacher, at least. Okay. He's on the is a teacher helping him go to the bathroom? Is that, is that what's no. happening? Or, no. Okay. okay. I thought we took care of that when he was like three. <laughs> So you have a documentary called I'm Going to Break Your Heart. So for those who are unfamiliar, can you sort of give us the Coles Notes version of what this is? Yeah, we're just uh, wanting to make our first project together. And it's very hard to uh, get, you know, the space like a lot of moms and dads can profess, you know, just trying to get a sentence in is hard. Never mind write a song together. And, you know, it's a lot of a lot of the together ends up being, you know, um, going to maybe a basketball tournament together or, you know, a school function together, but, but to actually, you know, sit down and do a project together, that was really hard. So we finally decided to go to um, this little Island called St. Pierre in, in Miquelon. Can you hear me? Okay. Still or no. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then um, we, we had kind of simultaneously or like before we, even before that we'd, We'd, we'd gotten some coaching um, to help us be, you know, uh, stay together. <laughs> you know, I think, I think you're kind of, unless you're be like better a small person. How about that? <laughs> yeah, better to communicate, to communicate better. Well, we kind of learned that unless you're this very small percent of the population, you're, you're probably either going to be divorced or winging it and miserable a lot. And, we didn't want to be those people. So we decided we would, we would go figure out this, how to communicate, how to be better, better married. We also we knew, we also knew, we knew this was going to be like a big challenge for us creatively because two very like, yeah, not opinionated, but we just, we just, we just know what we wanted musically with each other. Yeah. And I think yeah. like we needed yeah. to be, we needed yeah. to be smart about going to the Island. We needed to be smart about having the tools yeah, we it was going to get ugly and we, and we were filming we go, it. We need to go prepared, you know, prepared to communicate and be kind and all those things. And so we decided that we would enroll our, our um, marriage coach to do, you know, some topping up beforehand and maybe after or whatever. And, you know, the way it all unfolded was the, the island itself. When Rain said, oh, we're going to go to, we, we love San Pierre and Michelin. Rain said, we're going to go there. I was like, oh, that's great. When are we going? He's like, like, in January, like in the several weeks. And I was like, you don't want to go there in January. It's awful. It's Atlantic cold. Like, yeah. no. And he said, Nope, that's what we're doing. And I was like, okay, you're going to regret that. So in the film, it's very beautiful, but you know, we landed and like most people are leaving for the winter. They're going to, you know, Nice and, and other, you know, other places, warmer places. Not there. And so, <laughs> yeah. And so, and so the, the islands, one of the characters almost in the film, it's, it's a bit the villain in the film. And then, you know, depending on who's watching the film, maybe Rain's the villain or I'm the villain. I don't know. But um, we get into it. We get into, you know, this 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 communication thing and hurting each other a bit. But we get into the making of music. And 
So it's kind of, those are the two main, main plots, if you will. Right. So yeah. you, you really laid bare, I think, the ups and downs of your relationship, both personally and musically. So how did you feel when the documentary was first released? And how do you feel now that it's been out in the world for a while? I think we'd watched it enough times and we did a lot of the editing, um, that part of the process. And so once, once we signed off, we were, we were okay. I think, I think, Hey babe, the, a, a few times we watched it and, and like, we had these like kind of not debuts, but like these um, events surrounding the, the film coming out in various cities where we do a Q and a and perform a bit and watch the film with the audience. And it was pretty emotional. Um, I think the first time, you know, it was a little bit like, holy crap, people are seeing this. Um, but I mean, now it's small fries. <laughs> how, how I, I love it. Yeah. I love it because there's nothing there's nothing crazy that happens. Like it's yeah. kind of normal. And I think that's the best comment we've had yeah. from people over the, the last couple of years. It just normalizes partnerships like. I didn't throw Sometimes a chair out the window. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but that, that that's a little different because so much now of what's presented, and particularly people like you, because you're famous, it, we, we curate, right? And but even you know people like me, like you on your Instagram or Facebook, you present. We, we jumped what off. You want to? We jumped off the monolith. <laughs> yeah, so I, you... I honestly, I was going to say, I honestly feel like it's a relief, Ryan, in the sense of we don't have to anymore like that set the yeah. bar for us in terms of we can just be ourselves and be honest and i think people i think they were not respect it more but they engage with it more and that's what our shows are like like this tour that we're starting we probably spend half the time talking on stage um as opposed to playing and i and i don't think people walk away feeling like uh i thought they're gonna play more songs it's not about that it's it's more of an experience than just uh, a concert, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that can be amazing. You know, it's it's a different experience, right? And it's very unique. Like, I don't think many people can go do that. I don't know if Faith Hill and... Um, and McGraw can do that. Yeah, it's yeah. McGraw. If they, if they really dig in and do that, like, they're always pretty, pretty in a yeah. way. And I think even with the way the public sees them, but with us, it's like, it's it's just a, it's a different animal. Yeah, we just got really lucky. And I think it's it is it's transformational. It's transformational for sure. Um, I know this because the the impact the film had, the film and its music, but but also very much what Rain and I did lay bare, you know. Um it it, it really reflected back to us. That's a, one of the nice things about having these platforms is that you can have, you know, direct messages and yeah. and actually get to see how you've affected people with your artistic choices and your expressions and manifestations. And um, it's been really magical to, to uh, it's, it's been validating, but just, just beyond magical to read people's hearts, having seen the film. And being able and, to relate. Yeah. 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 That has so just I'm, been phenomenal. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, Faith Hill and Tim McGraw, and it got me thinking, uh, you've actually written songs for a bunch of other uh, really well-known artists like Kelly Clarkson, I think Britney Spears, Josh Groban, Carrie Underwood. Uh -huh. So are these situations where you met them and they asked you to write something for them? Or did you write these songs, you shopped them around and, you know, these are the people who bought them? They, it all they all happen differently. Yeah. Every every single situation. I actually wrote a song. Remember Brendan O'Brien asked us to write a song for Faith Hill. Yes, and we wrote oh, did that you too? we wrote that <laughs> one big shelter. I'll be shelter. A shelter. Yeah, she I don't I don't know if she cut it or it it, it didn't end up making an album. Yeah, but it was a great song. And if you wanna make another I remember that. It was good. Yeah, so everything's different. Like like the Britney Spears song came because um, well, I had this crazy session with this, you know, Simon Wilcox. She's actually an Ottawa originally girl. Um, brilliant, brilliant songwriter, amazing lady, friend of mine. We had a crazy session one day with this now he's gone through the roof producer, Ian Kirkpatrick. And she and I, we actually, we got a bottle of wine and we sat there and we just had the best, like, it was almost like we were just having like a girl, like whatever little retreat there. 
And he was just kind of playing these tracks and it was a very discombobulated session. And then we heard this one track and I was like, yo, that's so cool. And she and I wrote to the song. He, he hated the song. I think he hated me <laughs> and no one touched the song after. In fact, I've never had a fight with a producer at the end of that session. I think we told each other off. Like it was that wow. bad. And I left the session and I showed it to Ray. And I, I said, this song is bonkers. I, I, I believe it. And that's the thing about the music business. And I, and I think any business, you know, if you really believe something and you just, it's numbers, like you keep going, you know, just keep going yeah. <laughs> eventually, you know? Um, so, yeah. So I, I kept trying to think of people. I can't even remember all the people I hit up to sing that damn song and and no one else i don't i don't think anyone else liked the song or pursued it but i knew that song is so cool and then um my friend was engaged to britney at the time <laughs> rando so he was so excited and i i i said well i guess britney spears is my friend now can i send her a song through you and he said <laughs> yeah so he played it for her and she came to the studio a couple of days later and she sang it That's awesome. and then it was like a meme like Hillary Clinton danced to it and everything. <laughs> it oh, was <wow>. very cool. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm interested with that, you know, writing for other people, um, you know, the, the, the different sources of income now for artists, because with streaming being king and touring being very, a very different beast right now, how important are other revenue streams like writing for others and placing your songs in movies and TV shows, et cetera. How, how important are that? Is that for artists nowadays? I think it's all important because it's always shifting and changing. So I think you just have to keep, keep going, you know, I just don't, I don't think that's a reality for 98% of the artists out there in terms of writing and hoping that you get, yeah. you know, a cut or, or, or a hit song for another artist. If you're an artist, I think the, the, what's sitting in front of us right now is like a paradigm shift where you can for once own your own audience. There's a, there's a great book called a thousand true fans. <laughs> Um, written a few years ago that talks about that should be the strategy of trying to get a thousand fans that buy into what you do and then just build from there. And if you can get to 2000 or 3000 or 4,000 or 5,000, the economics actually makes sense where, you know, you can it's be an artist and live above the poverty line, but it's about connecting directly with those fans and not letting all these, you know, intermediary platforms that we put our faith in and build communities on, control our audience. That's interesting. I'm gonna have to read that. So in, in keeping with the theme of different revenue streams, uh, Rain, I, I was reading that you're involved with Sing, a, a company that develops tools to allow artists to control the distribution and, and monetize their work using NFTs. So are you still involved with that? And how does it work? Yeah, I mean, I consult with, with Sing. I was with them for a couple of years and I kind of moved away because I have my own platform called Drops with two R's that we actually developed before and beta tested before COVID and then when live music stopped, we had to shelve it, but it's back. And, and so are we And drops is really what I was just talking about. Even with the thousand true fans, it's all about how do I, how do I get that fan direct with me? And I look at it like my pain point is I've stood on stages for 25 years, legit played in front of like millions of people and 99% of them are still anonymous and that's not good. So my whole mission now is to help artists get that direct connect with their fans. Don't let fans walk out of a show and you not knowing who they are. And so that means basically getting them to opt into something, some sort of community. And so that's what Drops does. We just build communities and we give the data to the artists. We don't own it. So that's like, the big difference between every other platform out there is that we are trying to get you that data. We're not trying to, to, to leverage it and make this right. billion dollar company off of it think of think of myspace like that was so big yeah but then when it was done that was it like you you lost all your people what yeah, look at That's everyone insane. look at everyone look at everyone building all these cool communities on tiktok it, it'll it be gone actually might go away you know what yeah. i mean yeah. like and i it could really literally go away tomorrow i've yeah. been having a lot of fun on tiktok so that's great i i i'm you know that's great but um you know, no slag to TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or whatever. I'm sure we could all complain about all these various platforms in one way or another. But thing is, it's like us putting up content, that's for them. That's who's making bank on it. 
not right. not me. I'm not, I'm, that's not, you know, it, maybe it's a bit different for me because I'm like an established artist and I, 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 I enjoy connecting with my audience because then, you know, they know I'm, I'm alive and I'm doing my thing. And th- so it's a nice way for us to meet up. So I'm not mad and I'm not complaining, but at the end of the day, think of like all these people going on and doing their thing on TikTok and trying to get noticed and whatever. Yeah. It's like the only, the only, the only people benefiting from that are, are the people at the top of the chick TikTok chain. That's yeah. That's the reality. I, I find the, the, this idea of building community and connecting with community really, really interesting. Because I think it's it's a really positive way for both audiences and artists moving forward. I, I interviewed Dan Mangan uh, the other day, and he was talking about his side door thing where they're connecting artists right. with people doing the home concerts, and yeah. you know all that money going directly to artists and connecting, you know, building this network and community. And so it's just another way to me of, of building those connections. And I, I really, really like that. So, um, but switching off topic here, I, th- I was thinking about this and, and there are a few Canadian couples who are married and, and make music together, like Ooh. White Horse or Walk Off the Earth or Dear Rouge. And I'm wondering, do you ever chat with them about your common situations? <laughs> we did, we had a podcast for a minute, never really got anywhere because we're just too busy, but we, we were talking to other couples that collaborate. So not just musicians, but we did talk to. Um, oh my gosh, those people who did love, that in, in the valley below is like one of our oh, favorite. Okay. Bands. They're amazing. So we had them in our studio and we talked to them. What about? And then the we talked to people that like created. Um, what's that Netflix show? I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, M- 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 starts with an M. What? Starts with an M. M. Is, it, is this like a test, or do you know the name? <laughs> just uh-uh. I don't. If I I was hoping if I said M, then you'll remember. M- it's an animated show with Nick Kroll and John. Come on, uh, Big Mouth. Right? Big, Big Mouth. Big mouth. So the creators show. of that are like this couple that have, you know, done movies and stuff together on their own, or on their own and then finally came together to do Big Mouth. Um, and that was a lot of fun. It's just, like I said, um, too much work and no time. But um, right. yeah, I love I love talking to couples that collaborate. It's such yeah. an interesting dynamic, right? Yeah, great concept. Um so I was, and I was doing some research for this chat and and Chantal, I learned that you sing on the song Over My Dead Body by Drake. And I never yeah. would have thought of you two collaborating. But now that I know, it feels like the most Canadian thing ever. So I'm curious <laughs> as to how that came to be. Um, I think I was at the Thompson Hotel for some kind of a meeting or something like that. And then there was like over on the deck, a party. And then someone, I think maybe someone introduced me to Drake. I don't know. And, and he said, we should collaborate. Or I said, we should, I can't remember who said what, but then I said, um, are you here? And he's like, yeah, I'm here. And I was like, well, I'm here. And, and he gave me the address to go and and start because he still needed to be at his event for another hour or something. And then um, you started right then. Yeah. Right away. Right away. Yeah. And that was the first song that he was working on for, it was the first song that made it onto take care. Like it was the first song he worked on for take care. (laughs) <laughs> and um it was cool i i you know we it wasn't done that night like we you know we we did several sessions to to get it right and that's it yeah wow. pretty cool yeah mm-hmm. so one of the interesting things uh, i think about you is about you both is your involvement outside of music or using your platform to help so you've worked with like, a whole bunch of different charitable organizations you know, War Child Canada and one in particular, I know you've done a lot of work with. So what drew you both to getting involved with organizations like that? I like the grassroots I- aspect of War Child and knowing that, you know, um, it's not kind of this conglomerate type of thing. No one's, you know, making away with a big heist over there. It's like everybody's there because they want to yeah. be there and really affect change. And, you know, um, it's been like, almost 25 years since we started working as advocates um, for war child's programs. And, you know, I, I'm so glad that, that we were open to it and we did start working with them because they have truly proven themselves to be so worthy in the, in the NGO community. Um, um, And, you know, that war child has this cutting edge aspect of them where they knew like, forever go it's like it's all about partnership local partnership it's not about us going in and saying hey i think this would work for you it's about 
you know, really respecting the culture and the situation on the ground and finding people who, who they can work with. Um, and, um, and yeah, it's, um, it has just been a phenomenal journey. Um, I feel like they kind of grew me, grew me or us in a lot of ways. And I'm, I'm so grateful to them. I, I mean, I, I got into the idea of the power of music um, when it collaborates with, with any kind of <laughs> like, you know, NGO or, or charity or, or initiative. And it came early because I used to go to concerts when I was, when I was young and I saw Peter Gabriel um, one night at Maple Leaf Gardens when that was still a venue. And he talked about amnesty for probably 15 minutes. And mm -hmm. as you're walking out, everyone was handed like either a sticker or a place to sign up. And it just, I just was like, wow, that was a concert. And this guy talked about this, this human rights, you know, organization and how important it mm -hmm. was and talked about, you know, where these atrocities were going and people were listening, you know, no one walked out no one booed him and it just showed me the power of like mm. what an not it's not a necessity it's definitely it's everyone to their own if it connects with you but to have uh you know whatever twenty thousand people in a room listening to that where they may and i'd never really heard an amnesty it was like a learning moment and it just showed me how how important it is and impactful it can be if you find something you connect with and share that with others right well, before I let you go, uh, where can people go and watch the documentary, I'm Going to Break Your Heart? You can go to Google, what is it called, babe? Google, Google Film? Play. Google Play. And Google you can Play. Go it's, on, it's on YouTube Apple Film. iTunes. It's on iTunes. It's on, yeah, it's on YouTube Films. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I think it's on... We should um, have, that, we should have a better answer. It's fast. Right. It's, <laughs> it's on like Hulu and stuff too. Someone told me they watched it the other day on those kinds of things too. Okay, you know, if you, know. Google it. <laughs> if you Google it, there you go. All Just right, see, Google the hell out of it. <laughs> so you're performing uh, on December 1st and 2nd at the NAC. I believe the Friday night shows sold out and the Thursday one was getting close. So um, yeah. jump on those tickets. So will it be and there's a special guest too? Oh. <laughs> No. Will it be? Okay, he wants to come. And somebody wants to say that he's a special guest. <laughs> <laughs> There's a special guest right there. All I'm right. the special guest. All right. So, there it is. No, you're not. No, no, he's. I'm not, not special though. I'm just a guest. <laughs> okay. What will you be I'm playing? Not just a guest. First of all, that's my turtleneck, Ron. That's got it. Got got to come off, man. <laughs> It may look better then, on him. Uh, how about how Canadian is that? He's wearing yeah. he's wearing his dad's turtleneck. He's wearing my Esther the Wonder Pig. To, um, <laughs> Luke. That doesn't get more Canadian. <laughs> go Esther. There you go. go Esther. <laughs> so will it just be the, the two of you on stage or a full band? It's just gonna be the two of us. We we um it's funny. We found we, because we talk so much and it's getting, you know, more of the people that have seen the film or have seen us. I think they kind of expect that a bit. Like every time we have a band, they're just sitting around for half the show and like kind of bored. Yeah, but I, right. babe, I told you, I said it a long time ago. Like when we play alone, it's that's I, yeah. I think that's the magic anyway. I mean, I think it's beautiful talking, no talking when we, we play I, together. I like both. I like both. But we haven't played since COVID really. So um this is definitely going to be a lot of fun and, and we're just going to play a lot of songs and a lot you know different arrangements of of some of like you know some of lp stuff some of my solo stuff Chantal stuff but also some new this new album that we um have just started to make is i don't know could be one of my favorite um pieces of of work we've i've ever done just That's just great. by virtue of where the songs have started we finally you know, it's like we played enough now together. We really know where this can go, what sounds good. So the song is just kind of, we we started writing and like, it was like, I don't know, two or three songs a day for a few wow. days. So yeah, it's, it's really exciting. starting. Fantastic. It is. It's like, it's like, it's what you work for, you know, and now finally we're getting to see it. Um, yeah. Music's never easy, but this is easier. Yeah. And now you get to share it. So thanks so much for uh, for jumping on. It was really, uh, really a pleasure talking to both of you and the little special guest uh, visit from your son. <laughs> so have a great show and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks yeah, so much, Ryan.